thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be a part of this and be asked to be able to uh, share some things with you. I want to just test the technical stuff. Is that me or you? Okay, it works. Okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of a background of who I am professionally, because probably a lot of you have never heard of me, you don't know who I am. Um, I have worked in, I'm half American, half Swedish, so that's the connection here. And I've worked in executive search for over 15 years and um, basically was working in the US, moved to Sweden for personal reasons, I'll get into that in a little bit. And um, I have always worked with people and companies going through transitions and making that shift. And it's been through coaching, mentoring, and, and personal and organizational development. I am what I call a, a PD junkie. Do you guys know what that means, anyone? Yeah. Personal development junkie, right? Okay, that started my journey years and years ago. Um, I like to call myself the chief joy bringer, um, and that's because I'm all about joy, and we'll get more into that as to why that is. When we started to look at Engage, um, we didn't intend to write a book, actually, and I'll tell you how we came to this, because basically here it just says happiness gives on the job gives good results. And there's a lot of research behind this, so we're really excited about this. But we, there were several reasons why Sergio and I ended up writing Engage. And basically, you know, as I said earlier, we, we have always helped companies and individuals going through these transitions. And we just found there's so many people unhappy at work. You know, I'll get into some of the statistics here in a little bit, which are really scary, but people are miserable. And we've created this environment, society, where people just think, you know, work is drudgery, and we need to change that. Um, we also felt, after taking the best talent out of companies for so many years, we thought, why can't we teach companies how to keep their people instead? <laughs> and so um, that was another really big reason. And then as we started to talk to companies, we kind of discovered or put together this formula of how people are thinking differently. And we're going through this huge paradigm shift, as Tim had talked about earlier, and people are thinking differently. And so it's, it's led us on this journey of writing this book, Engage, right? So, engagement, when we started this book, um, I didn't find a, a definition that really encompassed what I wanted it to mean. And so, I came up with my own definition, because I thought, it needs to be broader, it needs to really define this. And so, the definition that we put together is to have full attention, commitment, enthusiasm, passion, and purpose for your work, and to be wholeheartedly involved in and contribute positively to an organization. Um, so today, as I'm speaking, engagement is really an important thing for me, so I want everybody focused here and being a part of it, and if I, you know, ask you to raise your hand, raise your hands, everybody? <laughs> oh, good, okay, we've got some engaged audience, that's great. So stay with me, okay, and, and we'll have fun with this. So the main question as to why we started to write this book was just like, why are some companies doing really well? Something's going on, they must be doing something different, right? And so we started on this journey of talking to these companies and, and talking to the employees and, and talking to the, the leaders and the management teams and really looking to see what are they doing differently because it was a mystery because everyone else out there was really struggling, okay? Um, this was two years ago. So, I mean, basically we've gone through these really tough years, economic years, and everyone is really dragging and the energy is really low, right? But then there are these companies that, wow, people are excited to be there and they're fully, you know, engaged and... and motivated and they're growing and they're hiring people and there's something going on. They have some secret sauce there, right? So we wanted to figure out what that was and what they were doing differently. So we looked at companies like um, Virgin, Zappos, HCL, Southwest Airlines, um, Achievers in Canada. Who in here has heard of that company? I'm just curious, the Canadians. I met so many Canadians yesterday. Um, and some of these companies you will have heard of and others you won't have heard of anything. And basically, we ended up with 15 companies and we very specifically looked to try and find companies in different geographical areas, different industries, and different ownership structures. So here we have publicly listed companies, we've got privately owned companies, we've got employee owned companies, so there's a, just a difference of, of these companies. And I'll share with you some of the research that we have and, and why you know we've kind of selected these companies. But today what we're gonna cover, and I'm I'm going to go through a lot of information here, but I'll, I'll give it to you in you know, a fun way, basically, is why engagement matters. Um, we'll talk briefly about some of the global trends and disruptive changes. There's a lot more in the book, but I can only cover a couple here. And then basically, what are, what's the red thread between these companies? This is kind of the, the secret sauce that they have, right? So these are the five cultural keys to creating a most amazing company. And then discovering your purpose, we're going to do a little bit of work on that, too. So. 
Um, I'm going to give you as much as I can to, but we've got limited time. If you have questions, feel free to come to me afterwards too. We'll, we'll hopefully have a little bit of time here to uh, interact as well. But why engagement matters. Our old ways of doing things just aren't working anymore, right? Who agrees with that? Something's happening, right? And if you look at it from an organizational perspective, Disengagement to me is like a disease. It's like, you know, who are the people that are disengaged? They're, they're very complacent, right? They're just there, then they're, they're checking in or in, in and out, right? And, and so that to me just seems like a cancer. There's something going on, it's disease, we need to fix it. When we started looking at the research, Gallup is amazing, They've, they do these yearly surveys, and the figures were just really astounding. I mean, it was, it was scary. And um, Gallup, in last year, basically, their report said 71% of employees are disengaged. I found out yesterday, actually, looking at just the Swedish figures, um, that was a much higher figure in Sweden, which I think is really scary. <laughs> um, so these are, act uh, these are employees that are disengaged or actively disengaged. So you've got, basically, you know, 29% of an organization that's at full capacity or engaged or, or being their full potential, right? But then everybody else is, is just checking in, and then you've got a small group that's really kind of kind of the bad apples, if you want to call them that, except that's judgmental, so we shouldn't call them that. Um, <laughs> but basically, they're the ones that are really doing damage in the organization. Um, we also found another study that said 84% of employees are looking to make, actively looking to make a change in the next year. And this has been up in two years in a row, which means they're not happy. They're, you know, they're mentally thinking of, okay, where's my next place? And oftentimes, what I've heard a lot is, oh, I've got to escape the corporate world. Who in here has escaped the corporate world, right? Why should the corporate world feel like a prison or a jail? Hello, <laughs> we've got to fix some of that, right? Um, and, and the bottom line is disengagement is costing companies a lot. Um, on a, on a, this is actually US figures, but um, Gallup says, you know, um, proportionately, it's, it's pretty similar across the board for all, all countries, basically, but it's 450 to 550 billion per year in um, expense or cost and lost productivity that it's costing companies. So Gallup is great, they're very professional, but we wanted to go to, you know, what does Google have to say about this? <laughs> so I started typing in my job makes, and it automatically gave me the words and finished up the sentences for me, and it says, makes me <laughs> sick, suicidal, miserable, and angry. Those are the four top things that came up on my computer. I think this is different on, a, a, on different people's computers, depending on, I don't know what it is, but I added them all up, and all of that came up to 1.2 billion hits. We have 7.2 billion people on the planet, and 1.2 billion are feeling this about their jobs. Um, is this a global epidemic? Uh, I would say yes, <laughs> definitely, right? So this, to me, is like the heartbeat of humanity. What does Google have to say about it? Um, and the scary thing, you do this to my school makes me and you get the same thing, it's really, really bad. So um, we need to work on this, right? It's a problem. Do you all, do we all agree there's a problem here? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what's happening out there is so there's some things changing out in the world right now very quickly. And I'm going to touch on, like I said, just two of them real quick. Um, but there are others that are affecting us as well. But technology is obviously the, the, the big one, right? It's changing the way we do business, it's changing the way we communicate with each other. And we've always had disruptive change in the workplace. So if you look at the 19th century, you know, we, we moved from the agricultural model into the, into the cities when we started with the industrial age, right? With the factories and everybody moved in. And so that changed a lot of how the whole, how people lived and worked. And then basically in the 20th century, we went through, um, shifting from the factories into the office buildings and we started building all the skyscrapers and, and basically had what we call the information age, right? And now we're in the middle of this next transformation, which we like to call the virtual transformation age, which is basically, you know, you don't have to be in an office anymore, do you? No, we're connected. We've all got our little phones and you can check your, everything you, everything you need is there. So it's shifting again very quickly. Um, What's happening with this is that it's happening on an accelerated rate. So Ray Kurzweil says that change is not linear, it's exponential. So instead of, you know, everyone tries to think linear because we're trained to think linearly, but we're coming up into this, this red square now where it's happening faster and faster and faster. Who in here feels like time is going faster and faster? Right? That's part of this. It's because technology's making things. We're getting this information overload. Um, 
just to give you some uh, an idea here, we've got, you know, uh, on the technology side, we've got one billion new users coming online in the next year and more than four billion new people using their cell phones. And what's so powerful about the whole cell phone thing is that they're, they're bypassing the, the computer, but they're getting access to all the information, right? So it's really empowering people in a, in a whole new way and, and changing the way people look at the world. Um, the demographic changes are really important. So most countries are in, um, well, they, they're different, they vary from obviously diff different countries, but a lot of the Western countries are going through where they have this inverted triangle, so there's a lot of baby boomers and they're all retiring, right? So right now, when people are working longer, or living longer, so they're working longer, um, so this is one of the first times we've ever had, or the first time in, in, in you know, history that we've had four generations working at the same time. So there's very different values between these different groups. And there is also this mass exodus of people leaving the workforce because the baby boomers are retiring. But we've also got Generation Y coming in, right? And the Millennium Group. And I've seen some different figures on this um, where it can be this year, the Harvard Business Review says this year, um, half of the global workforce is gonna be this millenniums, this, this generation Y. I've seen it up to 2018 where it'll be half depending on the study. By 2025, 75% of the workforce will be this generation Y. Who in here thinks they look at the world differently? This generation Y? <laughs> Who in here is managing these millenniums? Yeah, they're, 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 I, I hear this a lot, but what are we supposed to do with them, <laughs> right? They just look at the world differently and they're actually pushing us, they're forcing us to change the way we do things because of the way they're brought up and the way they look at the world. And they're actually a generation that's pretty in tune to their values and purpose and all that, because they're asking these questions. But what does this mean in the corporate world? Um, basically, you've got a lack of retention and um, loyalty in the company, so it's very expensive when there's employee turnover within the organization. It costs 150 to up to 400% um, of the annual income for managers. So when companies are losing people, it, it affects them a lot, bottom line. Um, and then you also have a decrease in productivity and profits. So just for an example, stress alone is costing 300 billion per year, which is a lot. Um, you know, how can we solve that? How can we fix that? A lot of people out there will tend to focus in on the problems, right? Find the solution, fix the problem. And so they look at the economic growth of the workforce effectiveness, employee turnover, the, the chronic skills gaps, all of those things. But we tend to take a different stance on this and let's, you know, instead of focusing on the problem, let's focus on the solution. This was one of the things that we learned in those, those four years. We were always, let's not focus on the problem, let's focus on the solution, right? Um, and we came a lot across a lot of positive psychology research actually after the fact and realized, wow, we were using positive psychology without even knowing it. And um, when we found it and found a decade of research, we thought, wow, we, this is really a, the way that we can take this information into the corporate world. Um, but there's a, a quote by Bookminster Fuller that basically says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. So that's really our whole framework of how we're working with companies. It's to create something that's not heavy and change and all this stuff, but to do something fun and engaging over here that makes people say, oh, I want to be a part of that. What are you guys doing over there, right? Um, and, and actually, we call it cultural hacking, and I'll come to, to the reason why here in a second. But basically, why engagement works, again, Gallup is a, a great go-to study for all of this stuff, but they have shown that companies that are actively working with engagement and recognition have 27% higher profits, 50% higher sales, and 50% higher customer loyalty. They also, um, I mean, we found a lot of things, it's cut off there a little bit, but basically looking at the um, comparative stocks over a 10 year or 14 year period, um, looking at companies that are considered the 100 best companies to work for versus the general Fortune 500 stock market, they actually perform three times better than the general market. And cumulatively, it's actually four times better because it adds up year after year after year. So this stuff, working with engagement, used to be considered the softer part of business and people would be like, oh, that's for HR and we don't want to, you know, that's, that doesn't impact the bottom line, the figures and the numbers, right? Well, that's, that's not true. It actually has a huge difference and it's because the business is built on the people, right? And who's going to do the work? It doesn't matter what business, what industry, who's doing the work? People, right? Unless you get something like an automotive, you know, with robots, or whatever. But there's still people behind that.
find what we call the most amazing company. And basically what that is, is a company that's very deliberate in how they're doing business. They have a bigger purpose, okay? You can talk about a higher purpose, we call it bigger purpose. They lead with their why. And they have turned their employees and their customers into what we call raving fans. If you want the book, you can read all about this in there. But basically, I like to call them conscious companies, which, you know, to me, I thought, oh, that, that word is too much. It's, it's, you know, people aren't going to get it. But it's really coming to the point where they're very deliberate about what they're doing and they're focusing in on the triple bottom line. Who, in, you guys have heard of the triple bottom line? Yeah. People, planet, and profits, right? So, five cultural keys that we have in the book. Basically, um, first one is collaboration. We've heard a little bit about this through some of the different speakers. It's taking teamwork to the next level. It's really understanding that when you work together as a group, it's better for the whole, right? Um, Southwest Airlines talks about their front line is their bottom line. HCL Technologies, Indian-based company, technology company, went through this huge transformation from 2006 to 2010 or 11, basically, and the CEO wrote a book called Employees First, Customer Second and turned the pyramid upside down and really empowered the employees. The second cultural key is creativity. And that, what we mean by that is really allowing the innovation and creativity to come from within. Um, Puma did an interesting thing, I'll use that as an example here, where they worked with um, PwC for over a year to put a monetary figure on the entire production of a product. So if you're gonna have a pair of tennis shoes they were gonna make, they actually put a dollar figure or a euro figure, whatever, to how much water does it cost the environment to do this and to make the leather and all that. And they could make decisions actually looking at a very holistic way of doing business and decided whether or not it was good for the planet to do this. And if they, it wasn't, then they went back and changed it. So you get one large company like that doing that in an industry and it's gonna make everyone else look and say, wow, maybe we should be doing that too. So this is really powerful when companies can see these examples and say, wow, it works for them, maybe it can work for us. Mind Valley is a Malaysian-based company that we love, that um, they work in online internet personal growth stuff, basically, and, and they decided they were doing so many successful things online that they would just open source and tell everybody, this is what's working for us, and use it if you want. So I, I like to use the analogy of you had, they, everyone's playing in the sandbox, right? And we're all in the sandbox playing. And then they built a new sandbox and said, hey, come on over here, you wanna play in our sandbox? You're welcome and they open sourced everything. And it changes the industry. It's making people look at things and do things differently. The um, third key then is connection. And connection is really talking about how you connect internally to the employees and how you connect to externally to the market. And a lot of this is through communication and how it's changing with technology. Again, it comes down to the values and purpose. That's how you're gonna connect to people, right? So that's how you can turn people or employees into these customers, or employees and customers into these raving fans. Zappos writes a book every year and all the employees contribute and, and give their stories of, of what it means to work at this company and the values. And, and so they publish them and it's on Amazon and you can buy it every year. So, I mean, they're very, that's a great example of showing what you can do. Who in here needs more fun in their life? <laughs> Raise your hands, engagement please, fun, okay. Every time I, I love to, this is my unofficial survey, unofficial research here, because most of the time, like, you know, 95, 98% of people are raising their hand, and then you got the one or two that are like, all right, good, good for you, right? But we do. We take ourselves way too seriously all the time. So celebration is the fourth key, and um, Achievers is that Canadian-based company. They've built a business model all around helping companies work with recognition internally. Here we've got Richard Branson. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting, but he's dressed up as a flight attendant. Very, you know, beautiful flight attendant there because he lost a bet. And I mean, it's just he's having fun, right? But that permeates throughout the whole organization. Last one on the cultural keys is really um, looking at contribution. And this comes back to giving meaning to people, right? Um, Tom Shoes, uh, people have heard of Tom Shoes? It's you buy a pair of shoes and you give one to a child in need somewhere in the world. So here they were doing a campaign for Ethiopia. And they have started this movement called One for One. Good Ale is a Swedish company we found, which stands for good electricity. And all of their whole business model, 100% of their profits go to charities and their, their customers choose which charities to give to. So there's just new ways of thinking and, and showing that these business models actually work. In the book, we also talk about the 6P model. We like the C's and the P's, so it makes it easier for people to remember, um, or for me to remember anyway. <laughs> But anyway, so the, the, the six P's is really kind of the, the formula, and it's doing this internal work first. When you work with an organization, if you work on the purpose and the people and the passion, basically, 
you'll do this internal work and get people working together, and then you'll have the, the results of higher productivity, higher profits, and the ability to have a more positive impact. So it's the internal external, I always talk about that, because, again, on my journey, I went inside to find the strength, the courage, what I was going through, and that's what got me through that, right? Well, you can do that on an individual level, on a, on a family level, on an organizational level, and, and with a nation level. And so when you guys are working with values, this is some of the work that you're doing, right? So for us, all of these five Cs, it's all about the culture and the environment where people can thrive, but it's built on this bigger purpose. And that bigger purpose is really important. You know, we've talked a lot about, or you've heard a lot, companies are really good at putting together their mission. They're not really good at putting together their purpose. And the reason why, there's a difference between the two. And I've asked business leaders and they just kind of look at me like deer in the lights. What's going on? What are you talking about, right? The mission tells the what, the purpose is really about the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Um, who in here has seen that Simon Sinex Start With Why TED Talk? Okay, it's one of the most watched. Fantastic, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. This is his golden circle. Conventional communication, conventional way of presenting a company is to start from what you do, how you do it, and then maybe you'll get to why. So it's outside coming in, right? But this new way of doing thinking and the new way of this paradigm shift is starting from your heart, from why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And then you can tell how you do it, and then maybe, you know, who cares what you do? We just want to be a part of whatever you're doing because it sounds great, right? That's, that's the emotional response you want to get from the market. So for us, lack of purpose really comes from this, if you have a lack of engagement, it's because you don't have that purpose defined. And when you get the organization building and coming together and really defining that purpose, people will buy what they help to create. And that's how you work with engagement. So it's all kind of interconnected here. Um, just real quickly, there's studies out there now that shows what's motivating people. Money is not even on there, okay? So we've, we've, we've been uh, uh, exposed to that already, but basically it's community, it's this feeling of belonging. Um, it's this growth, and the, what that is talking about is not um, professional growth, but personal growth. Again, the pediatrics, raise your hands, you know who you are. My name is Karen, I'm one. <laughs> and then meaning, okay? Meaning is so important, and that's what's causing people to ask all these questions now, because if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, we want something that makes us feel significant, that it matters, because all of our other needs are pretty much taken care of. So that's a lot of the reason why this is starting to happen as well. And coming up with a purpose statement, basically it's a, it's a definitive statement that communicates the difference that you're committed to make in the world, right? Um, who in here has read Good to Great by Jim Collins? It's like the business book of the, the decade last. Well, all those companies that he was talking about, they're really tanking now, they're struggling, they're really, you know, they're, they're struggling right now. And it's, and for our perspective, it's like, okay, let's go from great to amazing, let's take it to the next level and really become these purpose-driven companies. We're shifting from profit-driven to purpose-driven. Bottom line, that's how it's happening. So this purpose statement is really essential for companies to put together, right? Um, and that's how you can reach the heads and the hearts of the people in ways that's going to inspire them, it's going to make them want to take the actions and to really be living the values, right, for the growth of the business. And there's so much great um, uh, research now talking about the brain and, and the neuroscience, right, and also about the heart, but you've got to connect the two and you can do that in the business world too, which is what's happening. So just to give you some quick examples of companies that have these purpose statements that I think are fabulous, Tom's again, one for one, very simple, three words, fantastic. Whole Foods, which is a grocery store that is focused in on you know, natural foods, basically. It's Whole Foods, Whole Planet, whole, or Whole Foods, Whole People, Whole Planet. Simple, right? Do you get it? What about Mind Valley, this Malaysian company? Pushing humanity forward. We stand for ideas and products that allow human beings to live healthier, happier lives. How does that feel to you? Wow, I want, I want more of that, right? You guys remember um, when Harry met Sally? <laughs> I'll have what she's having. <laughs> we want that in the business world now, okay? So Southwest Airlines, freedom to fly. Just sits well, right? Quick story on Southwest Airlines. You know when everybody, all the airlines started charging for bags to travel? 
Southwest Airlines had a consultant come in and said, oh, you need to do this. You're going to earn $350, more, $350 million dollars per year just by doing that. And they went to the, the management team and the, the board and said, no, we can't do that. It goes against our values. We're not going to do that. Why would we do something like that? And so the marketing team, they made a decision. We're not going to do that. So the marketing team got a hold of this and said, well, let's go tell the, the market why. So they went out and, and basically did this whole campaign for a year and said, we're not going to charge you. And by the end of that year, that Southwest Airlines had increased their revenues $950 million. <laughs> Why was that? Because they acquired all these customers coming to them, new customers, and because they sent the message out and stood by their values and basically communicated that and connected, right? So it does pay off. I love this. If an egg is broken by an outside force, life ends. If an egg is broken by an inside force, then life begins. So, great things happen from the inside, which is why we need to do the inner work. This is the finding your purpose, the values, that's your inner work. How many people are doing that? You know, not enough. We need to be doing that, and it works on an organizational level, too. So, real briefly, you know, discovering your purpose is how we work with companies now. Um, we go through the strengths and the stories. Again, stories. Companies have their own stories, too, right? Um, we work with collaboration, align values, orient your calling. That's basically who you're supposed to be serving and, and working with. Um, and then coming together and putting that purpose statement together so that you can get that out there into the world and really connect. It's time that we create sustainable business models that are working with these purpose-driven companies that are good for the people, the planet, and as well as the profits. And my dream now is to, when you go into Google in the future and you type, my job makes me, you're going to see passionate, happy, <laughs> joyful, excited, and then we'll know our work is good and complete, <laughs> right?